Hi everyone, I'm back with another podcast episode for you. In this podcast episode, I'm interviewed by Walter Remery, who's the founder and CEO of Airshaper. In our conversation on the podcast, we talk a lot about tidal turbines and tidal stream energy. So if you listen to my previous podcast with Dr. Chris Vogel, then you're going to hear many similar ideas and topics talked about in this podcast with water. And if you enjoyed that last one, I know you're going to really enjoy this one as well. Now, I had some discussions with water and we decided that what we were going to do is upload the full length podcast on my channel over here on Fluid Mechanics 101. And then over on his channel, what we were going to do is upload an abbreviated version of the podcast. Uh, and to go along with this abbreviated version of the podcast, we've got uh, additional clips and diagrams uh, and images overlaid with the talk. So if you're new to the, the area and topic of tidal turbines, then these talks and uh, these diagrams and figures that are overlaid onto the talk are going to be really helpful for you to help understand the topics as we go along through the podcast. So for those of you, if you might like a, a taste of what the podcast is going to be like, definitely head over to Walter's channel and check out the abbreviated version of the podcast. And then for those of you who want to listen to the full uninterrupted length of the podcast, you can watch that here on this channel just right after I finished uh, with the introduction. Now, right before I jump into the talk, it's worth just saying a little bit about Walter and what he's got over on his channel. Now, the focus on this channel over here on Fluid Mechanics 101 is really on the understanding and application of computational fluid dynamics in all its various forms and applications. Whereas over on Walter's channel, his focus is more on aerodynamics and the various applications of aerodynamics to uh, racing car design, aeroplane design, uh, and other such topics where aerodynamics is important. So for you as a CFD user, if you're in the field of aerodynamics in, in some way or another, definitely go over and check out his channel. There are some really fantastic uh, videos on there. He's got both uh, learning and understanding and teaching episodes where he talks about foundational principles and theories of aerodynamics, but also some great podcast interviews with some experts in aerodynamics. So if you're interested in hearing perhaps what uh, an Airbus design engineer thinks about uh, aerodynamics, then definitely there's, that's a great podcast episode you can go and check over over on his channel and is one that I listened to myself and found very enjoyable. So. That's just about everything for the intro. Definitely go ahead and check out Walter's channel uh, for his aerodynamics videos and also for the uh, short and abbreviated version of this podcast. But for those of you who are here and want to hear the full length podcast, let's jump into the video. It's definitely well worth listening to all the way through to the end. We cover uh, a load of foundational topics and ideas in tidal energy, and I know you're gonna find them extremely interesting. So let's jump into the podcast. Hey, Aiden, nice to meet you. Hi, Walter. Nice to meet you too. Uh, thanks for taking the time for this for this interview on um, wind turbine wind turbine slash tidal uh, power generation. So maybe a short introduction on your background and how you actually got into this field. Yeah, of course. Uh, so my background is I studied uh, a PhD at Oxford University in the UK, and while I was at Oxford University, I was part of the tidal energy research group that uh, okay. is currently working out of Oxford. And within that research group, uh, I did my PhD research looking at some very uh, specific aspects of uh, tidal energy research. So that's broadly where my background is. And I studied my PhD in uh, tidal energy for uh, four years. And the, the main methods I used were computational fluid dynamics to look at tidal energy. Uh, and having completed my PhD research, I've now uh, moved on to uh, do consultancy work uh, generally in the field of uh, computational fluid dynamics and in heat transfer. So I get to look at tidal energy and also lots, uh, lots of other interesting uh, engineering fields within the energy sector, uh, but all generally uh, within the realm of uh, energy, fluids, heat transfer. It's really, really interesting. I really enjoy it. Okay, yeah, it does sound interesting. Nice mix between things that are out there in the field and actually perform renewable energy and then the mathematics behind it. And I, I guess 
a lot of the things that you studied for the tidal power generation also link to the much bigger sector, actually, which is wind uh, turbines. Uh, how do they relate in terms of efficiency? And, and, and how do you look at the increase of efficiency of turbines over time, where we had vertical axis turbines, um, we had the horizontal axis turbines, we have two-bladed, three-bladed, four-bladed. And in the end, the winners seem to be the three-bladed turbine, but maybe have a bit more information on that. Yeah, of course. Uh, so I'm sure many of our listeners and many everyday people, when you go outside your house and you see wind turbines either uh, offshore or onshore in, in farmland, they all tend to look the same. The, the big yes. ones that you see all tend to look the same. They're three bladed. They have a what we call a horizontal axis. So that generally means you, you see the blade spinning this way rather than spinning around yes. uh, the cylinder like that. Uh, sometimes you see smaller ones, which are sometimes look a bit different, but generally, just as a casual viewer, all of the big ones seem to look exactly the same at a glance. They have three blades and they all look kind of similar. Um, and that's as industry has been around for a, a long time. And so what's happened is there's been a, a convergence towards this as the as the main design. And once people have established that this is the, the main design, then there's been lots of uh, efficiency improvements to make small improvements on the existing design and improve it to be as effective as it can. Uh, but that's, that's in the wind industry with uh, tidal stream energy, at least. So uh, tidal stream energy, the idea is, is we, we've got this idea of a, a three-bladed horizontal axis wind turbine. And the idea is, why, why don't we just take that same idea, take that same rotor, and rather than having it in a wind stream, why don't we put it underwater in a tidal channel? So if you're if you live around the coast, what you'll often find is that on the beach, there are very strong tidal currents. Or if you uh, if you ever go near an estuary or a river that that um, opens out into a sea or a lake, then often there's a tidal current under the water. Um, and the idea is, is that that tidal current is is quite uh, consistent and we can predict it quite well. We often know that the tide's going to go this way for a, a given length of time and then it's going to come back the other way. And that's quite reliable. So could we do something similar where maybe we took that wind turbine rotor and we, and we put it underwater? That, that's the general idea. And even as a, even as a lay person, you might think, well, probably the, the ideas and the fluid mechanics are going to be quite similar. That uh, probably a three, three bladed design, maybe that would probably be a good first guess for what I think would be a good uh, attempt at a rotor. But I know that water is quite different to air principally it's, uh, it's density, it's much more dense than air. Uh, and so maybe the loading on the turbine is going to be a lot, a lot, it's going to be a lot heavier. The water is going to exert a lot more force on the rotor. So maybe I could start with an idea of a three bladed uh, turbine, maybe something similar to the wind turbine. And maybe then I could do some investigations and think about how I might need to change that to account for the, the underwater environment. So this was generally the idea with the, with the tidal field. Um, and so I like to think of the tidal energy, at least in terms of the fluid mechanics, as, as, as an extension of the of the wind energy field. Um, that's <laughs> where, where would you like me to go from there? Um, that's well, a, quite a good introduction to explain the sort of the problem and what we're thinking about. Maybe with, yeah, indeed. With tidal energy. Indeed. So with tidal energy, indeed, the, the viscosity is different. Viscosity is also different. Mm, so yeah. we have a different Reynolds number, uh, which means mm. that you're in a different flow regime, to say, which means that you'll have separation at different locations, at different angles of attack and so on. Um, and when we look at wind turbines, we saw that indeed the, the industry converged to the three-bladed hor three horizontal uh, axis setup uh, for economies of scale, for e efficiency and so on. And then we saw minor tweaks or major tweaks to further increase that efficiency which was first of all to, to give the blades individual pitch control so mm. that you can change mm -hmm. the angle of attack for example we saw the Enercon blades with the winglets at the ends to increase efficiency yeah. through reduction of wing tip vortices um, we have those nicely swept blades that grow wider as they come closer to the base um, what kind of similar or, or opposite trends have you seen on tidal power generation turbines? So actually some of those uh, effects were actually some of the key hydrodynamic effects that I was looking at specifically in my, okay. in my PhD thesis. Um, the, so the first one probably, probably to talk about would be uh, the, the, the tip vortex effect. Yes. And 
Uh, for, for people who don't have a background in, in rotor design, the way to think of a, a tip vortex is it's, the, it's principally the same physics that occurs at the end of, of an aeroplane or a glider, where if you've got a, if you've got a lifting surface, then uh, on the top surface for a, for a wing or a glider, at least you've got a low pressure region and then underneath you've got a high pressure region, which is principally what generates the lift and allows the, the plane or the glider to fly. But as you approach the, the end of the wing, as you go out towards the end of the wing, you've now got that low pressure region on, on top roughly, and then the high pressure region on the bottom. And so that will tend to pull the fluid around the end of the wing, as well as going over the top and uh, generating the um, generating the lift. And so behind the plane, what you'll find is you get regions of uh, upwash and downwash, where that curling motion of the fluid trying to go around the bottom of the wing onto the top, that, of course, is propagated downstream of the plane and you have lovely uh, tip vortices yes. behind the plane. And then the way to think of this with a rotor is, of course, you get the same effect, but the rotor is, is also rotating. And so as that tip vortex is convected downstream, it's also going to be rotating with the, with the wake. So you have this lovely uh, tip vortex structure coming off the back of a turbine. And at least in, in my thesis, um, the question is, why would you be interested in this? Why, why, why do we care about the tip vortex generally? Uh, if, if you have a plane, you're very, you're very interested in how much lift your plane can generate. You want to make sure my plane has enough lift so I can, I can pick it off the ground and it can carry the, the load of the cargo on the plane. But for the, for the turbines, at least, what we're interested in is we're not really interested in lift exactly. We're interested in uh, the torque and the thrust principally. So we want to know how much uh, torque that rotor is going to be generating as it turns around and how much thrust or forward force it's going to be uh, leveraging onto that tower or the, the support structure trying to push it over. That's the way you, that's the way you can think about it. And the reason the, the, the tip vortex mechanism for, for a plane or a rotor is very important is it has a strong effect on what's going to be happening on the loading on the blades themselves right out at the edges. And of course, the, the reason that's important is you have a, a lever arm that you can think of yes. as a blade is rotating, the further it is from that hub, much like a seesaw, you've got a, you've got a moment effect. And so forces that are further away from the hub have a, have a large effect. And so you're really often quite interested in making sure that you can calculate the forces on those outer sections of the blade correctly because they're going to have a large effect on what happens for the performance of the rotor as a whole. And one of the, one of the small little experiments uh, I did during my thesis was just looking at uh, different ways that people have modeled that tip effect on the rotor. And often what you find is that if you don't account for it correctly, or if you, if you, if you get it wrong, then you can get thrust or power predictions off by 10% for your rotor. Uh, and, 10% 10, 10 is, is not unsurprising in an engineering field, but you can see that if you, if you are a, a developer, if you're trying to make a, a fantastic new turbine or if, or if uh, you're trying to deploy a, a site of turbines, you want to know where to put them. If you were off by 10% on the predictions of That's all of your turbines, it's, it's, going to have a, it's going to have a big effect. So actually the, the tip of a, a rotor is very important to, to get it right. So there's a, there's a, a good motivation to, to want to look at it. Um, maybe, so would you be interested maybe if I just talked a little bit about uh, what I actually did and how I looked at it, maybe? Yeah, indeed, because because there's there's two main topics, I would say, right? There's, mm. there, there's the single turbine efficiency, which is affected mm. by wingtip vortices already. And then there's the group or farm efficiency in, in, in which you leave a certain trail and the quality of the air or water is different. So the, the second, third, and fourth turbine um, down the line, they, they get a different input uh, flow field. And, and this can also affect efficiency. I guess you studied both concepts uh, in your thesis. Yes. Yeah. So the, yeah, let's, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about farms and layouts of turbines because it's really, yes. really interesting. And uh, definitely for any, anyone listening in the audience, there's still a very active area of research uh, farm layouts, both for tidal turbines and for wind turbines. Yes. And just the simple question of where do you put your turbines can have a massive effect 
uh, on the turbine it, it, you're about to put in and also on the turbines that are already there. And it's something that we're actually seeing uh, quite a bit in wind farms at the moment and also in the new tidal farms that are being proposed at the moment. Definitely one thing you can do if you're at home is you can do a quick Google search. If you Google uh, wind farms, new wind farms, say from the last uh, five, 10 years. And one thing you'll see straight away is that actually the turbines themselves, even from a photo, you can see they're a lot closer together. Oh, yeah. And that's changed a lot since the 80s and 90s, when if you look at a, if you look at a photo, you can see that the turbines are really, really far apart. They're, they're hundreds of meters away from each other. And so just from a, a Google search, looking at photos, you can, you can deduce that something has, has changed in the, in the thinking of uh, farm layouts and how we lay out turbines. And actually, there's a, quite a lot of research has gone on behind the scenes for looking at how you lay out turbines in a grid. And generally, the, the, way, to, the way to think about these is you can, you can think about it from, from first principles, where maybe you have a, a given area of land. If you've got, a, a, say, a square, of, a square of land that's been leased to you yes. by the, the Crown Estate or, yes. or someone, you've got, a, you've got a square of land, and you want to know where should I put my turbines in that grid? And straight away, if, if I place my turbines very far apart, then I can't have many turbines in my grid. If I space them really far apart, yes. maybe I can have yeah. 10 turbines. But if I space them closer together, then I have there are more turbines, and so I'm going to get more power out for, for the area of land that I'm leasing. So already you think, well, there's, a, there's definitely a driver to put the turbines closer together. But this is where you start to come into the, the physical effects of the, what the fluid is doing, as you exactly said, where if you put a turbine, for example, quite close to another one downstream, so if you put one right behind one that's in front, yeah. uh, all of the, the turbulent and unsteady air or water, if you're in a channel, coming off that turbine in front is going to impact the turbine downstream. And not only is that going to reduce the uh, the power output from the turbine because there's less uh, momentum you can think there's less mean momentum hitting hitting yeah. that turbine but the you can think of it as the quality of the flow is going to be reduced because it's not very uniform and smooth which is what you want it's going to be uh, choppy there are going to be eddies impacting the blades and the tower which uh, could maybe contribute to fatigue damage uh, so it is probably not a good idea to place a turbine directly yeah. In, in front of one. But then that leads to the, the next question of, well, how close is too close? Because if you've got if you've got your land, maybe you've got your, your area of land, and if I just have one row of turbines and there's nothing behind it, that's absolutely fine. So if I place them very, very far apart, then that air will have fully, or the air or the water will have fully mixed out and will have a nice smooth approach flow. But now I've only got two rows of turbines. So I want to space them a bit closer together yeah. so I can have more rows yeah. in. And then at what point is too close and when the air is too choppy? What, at what point is too close? So you've got that effect of the downstream spacing. Um, and one of the ways you can, you can calculate this, of course, is there, there are two ways. You could either set up an experiment. You could, you could, buy, you could get some scale model turbines or something similar, and you could, you could place them maybe in some kind of a wind tunnel or a flume or something and look. Well, how far downstream do I have to place them to get what we call wake recovery, where the, the flow yes. is, is fully smooth again? How far downstream do I have to put them? You could do an experiment. Uh, or if you if you can't have if you don't have access to some experimental facilities or for some reason you're concerned that maybe your your small scale models don't properly scale all the way up to yeah. full scale models, then maybe you would look at some, a tool like computational fluid dynamics to say, can I actually predict what the real system would do? And then maybe run some uh, computational experiments. You can think of it that way uh, to determine how far downstream should I put those, those turbines. Um, and maybe this is where we can, we can start to draw the first distinction between uh, a, wind, a wind farm and a tidal farm, where with a tidal farm, often you're going to be placing those turbines in, a, in an estuary, perhaps a, a yeah. river near, near the sea. And so you know that the flow is going to come in one way and then a certain period later it will reverse and then come back in the other way. And so that you know you know the downstream direction, you know the flow is going yes. to go in this way and then it's going to be coming that way. Whereas with a wind farm, it can be a bit more difficult because 
the wind the wind changes direction as well as speed all the time particularly if you're off sea um, offshore even uh, and so you may need to consider things like the predominant wind direction or maybe look at uh, uh, probabilities and occurrences of where does the wind change and where does it predominantly move maybe i need to uh, yaw the turbines into the prevailing wind direction but that can also be quite a tricky problem as well and so you can but you see that this becomes quite a difficult area of research that's definitely worth doing because you want to know, I've, I've leased this area of land, I'm going to put some turbines in, where do I put them? <laughs> it's a very yeah, And there's also the cost of the turbine question. itself. Of like course. doubling the number yeah. of turbines also doubles the cost of the, uh, of the turbine yeah. installation, of course. Uh, and also in my previous life, long time ago, when we were designing gearboxes for turbines, this also completely changes the, the lifetime of mechanical components. Like you said, there's fatigue on the tower, but there's, there's also a completely different load distribution spectrum, let's say, that the gearbox and, and the generator and so on have to take. Um, and if you have a lot of turbulence in the flow, you get these hits in, in terms of torque and much more variations and so on. And this indeed really changes the lifetime, which is typically 20, 25 years um, yeah. Yeah. For, uh, for those turbines. Um, and then there's a number of other aspects that also impact efficiency um some less obvious obvious things like 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 dirt deposition or icing on the blades mm. if you have wind turbines i can imagine you have a similar thing for tidal turbines where you have maybe organism growth on the surface and so on is, has that been documented or is there lots of experiences that regard or is that still new so there's there's definitely some appreciation that uh m marine life growth i think they're calling it at the moment yes. marine life growth on turbines uh, is is a big problem uh, and you can think of it in the same way as, as icing at least for the aerodynamics or the hydrodynamics of the blades yes um and the the issue with the tidal industry at the moment i think it's definitely worth people uh bearing this in mind at the moment is that the industry itself is still relatively new and so we've had a few a few demonstrator projects over the past five ten years where people have put got a turbine towed it out on a ship and put it underwater yes. Uh, and monitor it to see what happens. And they have found that one of the problems has been marine life growth on the on the structure itself as well as the blades. Um, yes. But there's not a there's not a massive amount of experience yet with it, just because of the sheer number of turbines that they've actually tried to put in the water yet. Um, yeah. There is there is one um, potential positive from it though, which uh, is sometimes talked about, and that is um, there's often a concern that when we install uh, some kind of energy installation, whether that be a, a power station or a wind turbine or some some solar panels, that it can uh, damage the the local ecology of the area that we install yes. install the object into. So there are often concerns about uh, bats and birds flying into flying into wind turbines. There are similar things with naturally tidal turbines underwater. There are concerns that uh, fish or large marine mammals could impact the blades. But there is a potential positive in that. The, uh, the the structure, at least, of the turbine when it's drilled into the ground or supported on, on some kind of structure uh, can actually start to support marine life if it's very carefully designed. And so you can have small, uh, small organisms and things growing actually on the structure if you're very careful about how you do it. And so in a way, it can sort of promote uh, marine life particularly as some of these turbines are installed in areas where the current is really fast. So you imagine you've got a strong yeah. tidal current whipping along the seabed and you would want that for energy extraction because you'll get have a lot of power available to your turbine. But it can often mean that the, the, the sediment and the, uh, the local environment that would be available for, for marine life to grow just gets whipped away by the current. And so actually providing some structures and things for uh, marine life to grow on may end up being beneficial to the local wildlife so this is something yeah. that people are uh, <laughs> naturally supportive of in the early stages <laughs> an yeah, energy indeed. installation that has a positive uh, environmental impact is, is always good if we can achieve that yeah indeed and in terms of evolution of the segment we'll, we'll get to market um, importance and, and, and relevance and so on in a bit but um, when you look at the trends in the word mint turbine industry like like not even 10 years ago the the standard was maybe two megawatts and now it's turbines of 14 15 16 mm. megawatts that have been announced and are being built do you see a similar trend for tidal power generation where 
bigger is better or is it different with the density changes and so on yeah so with uh, the the limitations for tidal turbines are actually slightly different for wind turbines okay. for a for a wind turbine uh, as a lay person you, you may not understand the power output or, or or know what is a particularly powerful turbine and what's just a normal turbine but one thing we can see in here is that the turbines themselves get bigger yes. and there have been some some interesting uh, schematics and diagrams I, I've seen recently coming out of comparing wind turbine sizes to famous monuments from around the world, like the yeah. the Eiffel Tower or the, the Statue of Liberty. And they have comparisons of the, the height and diameter of the turbine compared to these famous monuments. And they're getting bigger and bigger. Yes. And the, the principal reason for that is they have a, a sort of a larger a capture area. You can think of it for capturing the, the energy from the wind, but with, and that, that, of course, leads to then limitations often on the, the material properties, the, the bending exactly. loads and the gearbox and things, which end up being the limiting factors. Um, and interestingly as well, how you might transport blades that are massive uh, along is. roads and offshore. <laughs> can be, uh, if you look on Google, there are, there are some quite interesting images you see of these massive trucks and convoys just hosting a single blade all the way along the road to its final destination. But with uh, with tidal energy, the constraints are very different. And the reason for that principally is the, the tidal turbines are installed uh, in a coastal environment, either in an estuary or perhaps off a headland quite near to the shore. And the water depth is, is quite shallow yes. in comparison. So the water depths I think that are being looked at at the moment are in the range of 20 meters to 50 meters, say. Um, so of course it's very it's very deep water. It's much deeper than your swimming pool, yeah. Yeah. Um, but you are you're limited in terms of the size of the structure or the rotor size uh, that you could that you could install in that kind of an environment. And as well as being physically blocking, you wouldn't want your turbine to be coming out of the, the yes, surface, exactly. <laughs> particularly if you've got a a variable depth site as well. You wouldn't want yeah. your you wouldn't want your turbine to be cresting the surface. But there's also a, a difficulty with um, what's called the the shear in the in the flow profile approaching the turbine, and to, to understand this, it's a problem which occurs for wind turbines as well, where the the wind speed very close to the ground is is very low. The, the wind yeah. doesn't move very fast close to the ground, but then as you go higher up into the atmosphere, the wind moves a lot faster, and so if you've got a very small turbine, this this doesn't this doesn't really affect you. You don't. You don't. You're not worried about it. But if you've got a turbine that's really, really big, that's massive, that's tens of meters in in diameter, then as that single blade passes up through the upper atmosphere and then down towards the ground, the the uh, the the wind loading or the velocity and the force that's hitting that blade at the very top is much larger than when it's uh, at the bottom. And so this exactly. this can this can uh, result in a, in a fatigue loading every revolution. And that tends to only be a problem for wind turbines as they get bigger. But for tidal turbines, one thing people have found by uh, putting in probes into these tidal environments to look yes. at the velocity profile that's there, uh, they find that the, the degree of shear or the degree of difference in the velocity near the water surface is, uh, is much larger than it is near the seabed. Okay. Um, and so this is this is likely we we don't really know yet, but uh, yeah. the computer models at least are predicting that there's going to be significant uh, once per revolution loading as that blade comes up to the surface and the loading is very fast from that free surface flow down towards the the sea floor and the loading is very is very low. So that's definitely one limiting factor on the tidal turbines. You've got to think that you're in this confined space environment. We've got the free surface and the and the bed below the turbine. And when we look at um, the sites in the world that actually are suitable uh, to, to generate uh, significant amounts of, of, of tidal um, energy, um, I remember doing like like a, a market research analysis on this like ten at least ten years ago, and then mm. the conclusion was that suitable sites. You have the Orkneys. Um, you have Nova Scotia and Canada, I think, and then there are a few, a few other interesting locations. But apart from that, it was in total much more difficult. And there are far fewer sites that really make it easy to just plug and play a turbine and enjoy the energy. I, I, do you think it will always be a niche market? 
or, or do you think that it might just break through at some point? So uh, I think it's it's worth us thinking about what the uses of uh, energy and electricity generation are. Okay. So the the first the first use of energy or electricity generation is is large scale uh, industrial electricity yes. generation to make a significant impact on on the uh, the com- the country or region's electricity network. And yes. we're, we're used to this with things like uh, big power stations where the uh, gigawatts of, en- of electricity are, are produced by the power station. Um, so there's, there's that application for energy as well. And then the other application for energy as well are uh, small remote sites as well, which may be uh, disconnected from local uh, energy supplies. Uh, and this can happen on in islands or remote communities or even offshore on offshore installations like uh, oil platforms and things. These, these sites need energy, uh, energy and electricity generation as well. Yes. But uh, so you can think of something like the tidal power uh, generation in, in the two camps. There's the how can it make uh, how much of a contribution can it make to the overall large scale um, energy uh, infrastructure? And then what kind of a contribution could it make to small remote sites? And one of the benefits surprisingly of having a a limited number of of sites for tidal energy is that the sites like the orkneys and nova scotia are quite well documented so you know what the what the flow speeds are going to be and how frequent they are and so actually you can do quite quick calculations to work out what's the maximum energy that i could extract from this site if i were to look at it and unsurprisingly we find that the contribution to the to a, the country or the region's energy supply is is not is not massive so it's not going to produce uh, as much as uh, several nuclear power stations yeah. so it's in terms of overall uh country's electricity balance it's it's good for us because it means we we can work out quite quickly how much potential resource is there for us to extract we can we can know that um we can calculate that and it makes a, a a it makes a noticeable but not uh not game changing experience yeah. uh, and i think you can even if you just thought about that practically you can imagine that maybe in a, a place like the united kingdom where we we have the orkney islands and the bristol channel even if i filled that up with turbines and fully extracted the resource that's never going to replace all of the electricity supply for the country it's never going to explain uh, it's never going to replace the entire country's infrastructure for for uh, nuclear and hydropower and solar power it's never going to replace everything but it does make a noticeable contribution yeah and, uh, definitely, indeed, for the, yeah. and definitely for the future as we're uh looking for as, as many uh different renewable resources as, as we can i think ev- every little helps is probably the motto to have um then oh, sorry to jump back in again no, no, i no. think this 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 is also very interesting as well that in terms of remote sites as well is that by by, <laughs> by happenstance, many remote sites, which tend to be in places like uh, islands or headlands or small communities by the sea or offshore, which are difficult to get electricity generation to, um, often are sites that have tidal resources available to them. <laughs> this is the reason why they're yeah. difficult to get to. Exactly. Um, and there are sites uh, around the world as well. One of my colleagues was were, was looking at sites in, in Malaysia where small communities currently only had diesel generators on site to power their uh, medical facilities and their infrastructure. And for those sites that are quite difficult to get grid power connections to, and they have their diesel generators. And actually for those sites, installing a, a local tidal energy device actually seemed to be the perfect fit for them because they had the resource there, fast tidal channels, they were quite remote anyway. Um, and so definitely tidal energy has its, it has its an important and useful place within the overall energy mix. That's, yeah, that's at least my, my view on it. Yeah, yeah, and it's not just cost of energy because cost of energy mm. is, I guess, driving the major supplying sources, major sources of energy like nuclear, solar. They've been competing and and, and looking at each mm. other, and gas-powered uh, turbines and so on. Um, but there's also the, the practicality and the availability in remote locations, and cost of energy maybe 
gets to the second place instead of the yes. first place, which is we just need it. Uh, if there's nothing else, then this is the best solution indeed. Um, what, what do you think are the next steps for the industry? Will will we see one or two players players emerge as the, the dominant ones, and they will mm -hmm. start outlaying installations across the world, or, or what do you think? So definitely from the from the from the research I've been a part of and through uh, discussions with companies at conferences and things the, uh, the the main issue which I think will definitely make or break the industry and the thing that people are focusing on at the moment is the issue of uh, lateral blockage within channels and yes that that sounds like a bit of a fancy a fancy science phrase what what does it mean well principally it means when we talked about uh, laying out of devices earlier, we talked about what would happen if we placed turbines behind each other downstream. Well, in a tidal channel, you imagine you've got a, maybe you've got a headland site or an estuary and you've got a fixed width of the channel. Yes. And what happens, of course, when you put a, put a turbine into the channel is that the turbine will extract some energy, but it also applies a resistance to the flow as well. Yes. And so the remainder of the flow will, will try to go around the turbine and there's some diversion of the flow by the turbine itself. And so what you can do is where the flow is diverted around the turbine, it's locally accelerated and you can put another turbine in that region of high flow. And so what you can actually get is you can get turbines uh, interfering with each other constructively. That's often okay. the phrase that's used where if you put one turbine in, it gives off a certain, it extracts a certain amount of power. But if you put the second turbine in and you put it in, in in the correct place, that turbine will actually perform better than the original turbine. And the original turbine will also be improved by the presence of the okay. second turbine. It's so a very interesting fluid dynamic effects that you can get with tidal turbines. And the principal reason for it is the, the flow area or the channel that the turbines are sitting in has a has a has a finite area and so when you start resisting in one place the flow diverts and goes somewhere else and so you can strategically place your turbines and arrange them uh, to actually extract more power uh, than if they were placed in isolation and this is this is definitely the uh, the most interesting discovery at the moment with the tidal turbines uh, because what it means is that as well as choosing very carefully where you place the tidal turbines you can also design the turbines specifically to take advantage of this uh, interaction effect that you get between turbines so yeah. the way to the way to think about this is you have your first turbine in which may look like a, a normal wind turbine but then the flow is accelerating around it and if you now put your second turbine in in that region where the flow is going very fast the, the flow approaching the turbine is a lot faster. So maybe you would either want to spin it, spin the turbine at a different speed maybe, oh, yeah. or you might want to pitch the blade at a different angle so you get a, uh, an optimum angle of attack on the blades, or you may even redesign the blades themselves to retwist them or increase their cord. Um, and some of the research that's been coming out recently is really fantastic, showing that... Um, this this phenomenon can lead to quite significant improvements in the in the efficiency of the turbines, um, and my my personal belief at least is that uh, wh whoever can work out and master this interference effect between turbines uh, will end up being the the dominant player in the field and will end up setting the the precedent for how the turbines look and how they're yeah. designed and employed in future. It may be, for example, that the the standard design becomes Oh, well, the standard design is eight turbines arrayed with this spacing, and this is how the blades are pitched, and this is how they're rotated. You may have, you may even have the end turbines, for example, rotating faster than the than the turbines in the middle. So you can have preferential diversion of flow towards other turbines. You can have load balancing across oh, yeah. the arrays. It's it's really really interesting, and it's something that we hadn't really come across with wind turbines. And the reason we hadn't really come across it with wind turbines, of course, is the wind turbines exist in a massive open atmosphere and they're very far apart. So with one turbine, the flow, of course, does go around it, but there's so much atmospheric air around that the interference effects are very small. So the, with tidal turbines, we're actually designing deliberately for interference. Uh, 
I think that's probably the most exciting, uh, most exciting area in the field at the moment. Yeah, when you say it's going to be a decisive factor, that means you're talking about mm. 10, 10, 20, 30 percent difference in efficiency uh, for it to be yes. a decisive factor. It's just like birds flying in a V pattern. Do you think there's that's also exactly a, right. a an axial offset in terms of turbine spacing, or would they still be aligned in in, in one area? So that's. Uh, that is something that has been looked at. You can imagine that yeah. uh, with, this is quite a large uh, potential field of investigation. You could look at all sorts yes. of things. You could have you could have maybe one turbine offset from the other. Yeah. People have even looked at things like rather than rotating the turbines in the same way, could you perhaps rotate them in uh, opposite ways to each other? Maybe you rotate them at different speeds. Um, do you stagger the 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 arrays considerably or do you just have small offsets uh there's obviously quite a large sort of parameter space you could look at um, yes, which is quite useful if you've got a lot of uh phd students or research yeah. <laughs> funding you've got a lot of potential things you could look at and keep uh, inventing new layouts um but this is this is part of the reason why uh with sites like the the, the mage end site in scotland which is a sort of experimental testing site that they're actually putting okay. turbines in now uh, their main plan is they they plan to install arrays of turbines rather than turbines. The big plan is when we're planning out this experimental site, we want to look at how do the turbines work together as well as how do they work individually. Yeah. You can imagine if you just put a single turbine in the water, you could uh, take lots of measurements and watch how it works and then use that to improve your design and tune your models. But the key thing with the title is that we want to know how do the turbines work together when we put them in. And so this is why you'll see, if you look up tidal installations at the moment, they're planning arrays of turbines. I, th I think at the moment they're looking at a four turbine array, which you can imagine is quite a small installation. And then there are plans to look at bigger arrays as well. Okay. Um this kind of points in the direction of open bladed turbines, but there's also ducted turbines, which actually do something kind of similar. They try to limit the wingtip vortices by putting a shroud around it, but this would yeah. also reduce probably the beneficial effect from a neighbor turbine. Do you think the decision has been made to go for non-ducted turbines, or is that still an open question? Uh, so. The interesting thing with the tidal energy, uh, the tidal energy community, at least, is uh, people have tried a variety of different designs yes. over the past ten to fifteen years. And uh, I've forgotten the name of the device, but there were some devices installed uh, in France, I think, which had the, the sort of the ducted design. Where you've got a you've got a, a duct, and then you've got blades which look like teeth inside the duct, and then yeah. a, then a hole in the middle. The and open then you have hydro, others. maybe the open hydro. That's the one. Yes. The open hydro design. Uh, and then you have other turbines which look uh, like a conventional wind turbine, three three blades, but yes. a bit more chunky because the water's <laughs> quite a, a lot denser. Uh, and then some two-bladed designs as well. I've seen a few two-bladed designs, some yes. of the older ones. Um, so it's definitely there. There hasn't been a consensus yet on, on the design. Uh, the, the one thing that is coming out at the moment is the, uh, at least in terms of the, the, the ducted designs and designs with sort of large support structures uh, is when you think of that tidal channel in the analogy that we were thinking of before, uh, when, a, when the water or the air comes along and it hits an obstacle, you can think of this even in a river, if you've got a tree or a big rock in the river, and when the flow hits an obstacle, it, it goes around on either side. Yes. And it actually doesn't matter what that obstacle is, whether it's a rock or uh, a stationary turbine, a rotating turbine or a turbine with a big heavy ducting structure or a large sort of supporting brackets on it. And so generally the larger the obstruction you put in the flow, the more the flow diverts around the device. And one way of thinking about it is that extra structure and ducting or supporting pylons, you often see sort of tripod installations and things, yeah. all of that is gonna be diverting and pushing the flow away from the turbine. Uh, which may ultimately reduce its own power, but could be used for other turbines. Um, okay. So this is at least why uh, some of the more modern ones I've seen over the past sort of five to 10 years have, have been moving more towards uh, looking like wind turbine designs, at least in terms of a, a single cylindrical mon monopile for the, the installation to the floor and 
three blades with a very with a very small hub in the middle and no shroud is yep. they're kind of they're minimizing that additional structure which could push the flow uh, away from the turbine that's at least in terms of the the hydrodynamics but uh, of course you do the other thing you have to think about is the tidal flows and the tidal currents are pretty fast and they're very aggressive in these sites and so if you don't put enough structure down the turbine could be washed away the blades yes. could be snapped off and so there's definitely going to be uh, a, a compromise in there, I think, at least with the you need the structural integrity, but then you also want to sort of maximize the power as well. Yeah, indeed, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> okay, I, I think that concludes most of the, um, the, the topics and efficiency-related matters for hydrodynamics and aerodynamics. Mm. Do you have anything else to add, Aiden? Um, yeah, maybe, maybe I could talk a little bit about... Uh, Oh yeah, the other the other interesting thing with tidal turbines as well um, is uh, cavitation as well. Yes. This is something that uh, doesn't re doesn't apply to wind turbines at all, but with the with the tidal turbines uh, is another sort of peripheral uh, aspect that that needs to be thought about, and it it actually ends up being quite tricky. And okay. I think I think most people with a naval architecture black background are are aware that if you have a, a propeller underwater for a, a, a ship and if you if you spin it too fast, yes. what happens is you're exerting more and more thrust on the flow, uh, and of course the pressure is going to be is going to be dropping in 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 the water, and you can reach a point where if you locally reduce the pressure below the the vapor pressure, then you start getting bubbles bubbles appearing yes. uh, in the flow, and those bubbles can can impact your 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 hull of your ship or your uh, support structure of your turbine or your blades and they can they can cavitate and lead to, to massive damage and this is something that the turbine uh the turbine designers and manufacturers will have to think about uh, as well as just the hydrodynamic design and it's actually a little bit more uh, a little bit more tricky and a little bit more involved than than one might think because at least with a with a propeller the propeller will be at a, at a certain depth below the the free surface and so you could perform all of your cavitation calculations for that small propeller just below the surface but with a with a tidal turbine at least if you've now got a big a big rotor that fills most of the depth of your channel maybe it's 40 or 50 meters deep yeah. as the blade swings through to the bottom of the channel you're at the bottom of the ocean the the, the pressure is quite high because you've got the hydrostatic pressure is quite high yes. there but then when the blade returns up to the surface, the pressure is, uh, the pressure is reducing. There's not as much hydrostatic weight uh, bearing down on the blade. Okay. And then if you're spinning your turbine very fast or you've got very thick blades, that pressure can drop and you can get quite close to cavitation locally. So you can see that the cavitation risk is different at different locations in the rotation. And it may also change depending on if you have that array of turbines laid out and they're now diverting the flow around them so the flow is going a lot faster into another turbine that could push those other turbines closer to cavitation as well so the cavitation thing will start to become quite interesting in terms of array design and you can see really mm -hmm. with with tidal turbines where this is all going is you're taking these problems which for engineers we have anyway we often have to think about cavitation and, and loading on blades and things but now you're thinking about them at an array level rather than just for one turbine and how these certain effects can interact with different turbines and the more turbines you put in and how you operate them can change these effects across your array so you end up as an engineer you have to think you have to be able to now think in terms of one turbine and 10 turbines as well and how these effects are going to change so there's definitely lots to do if you want to if yeah. you want to do a, a PhD or some uh, some research. It's a it's a very very interesting field and definitely I I learned a huge amount uh, from it. it. It was really really interesting and really really beneficial to me. Yeah, it's a nice combination of, of different topics and subtopics within the field That's of it. fluid dynamics, whether it's it's water or air. This is really uh, broadens your theoretical base, I would say. So that's a good promotional video as well mm. for people wanting to do PhD. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much, Aiden. It was really interesting. Um, I hope the viewers also liked it. And if they have questions, obviously they can contact both of us. Uh, I assume to 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 learn more about it and. Um, 
with whichever bits are public, um, they can also maybe um, find some parts on, on, on this PhD work that you and your colleagues have done in the past. Um, so thank you very much, Aiden, and um, have a nice evening, and I hope to talk to you soon then. Yeah, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. It's been a really, really interesting chat. So that wraps up my discussion with Walter Remery from Airshaper. Let me know in the comment section, did you enjoy the podcast? Did you find it useful and interesting? Did you learn anything new or find something particularly interesting from the podcast? Let me know in the comment section and share it with everyone else. I do really enjoy hearing from you, hearing your feedback and how you found these podcast episodes. Now for the near future, I have got some more interesting podcast guests lined up. It's going to be slightly different guests, what we've seen uh, so far on the Fluid Mechanics 101 podcast. I know we've already covered uh, Tidal Stream Energy twice now on the podcast. I'm going to be bringing in some different guests uh, to give you uh, some interesting conversations for different areas of fluid mechanics and CFD. So if you're excited to hear these podcasts and hear more, definitely let me know in the comment section. I really do uh, appreciate your encouragement and hearing from you. And as a final reminder, of course, if you are interested in aerodynamics in general, remember to just click on the links and go ahead and check out uh, Walter's channel there over on Airshaper. He has really got some fantastic uh, content for aerodynamics and some more interesting interviews with uh, experts in aerodynamics. If you want to see more, definitely go ahead and uh, check out his channel. I know you're going to find some uh, really useful and interesting content over there. So until next time, thank you all for tuning in and listening. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you next time.